Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, right. In this odd time that we're in, <laughs> um, I, it, I think we have some new folks to the uh, consortium today, so probably best to go around and start with some general introductions. Uh, my name is Mike Baliniak. I'm at Hamden Sydney College in uh, Central Virginia, and I've been the steering committee chair for the Palm Network for um, several years now. Um, SUWIC is your usual point of contact for um, all things Palm. I'm, uh, I've been doing a lot of the logistical work with Palm, and my main function has been coordination of these journal clubs. So happy to have you all here. Um, because you're all probably on different positions on your screen, I'll just call names around and we can introduce ourselves. Uh, let's go ahead and start with Jane. I'm Jane Wessinger. I'm at the University of Minnesota and I am new. I'm working with uh, Zach. Uh, and what else do you want us to say? I'm the Organic Laboratory Director, so I teach um, both. A, uh, I'm also uh, passionate about green chemistry and sustainable chemistry, so I teach a uh, senior level uh, green green chemistry course at the University of Minnesota. I'm happy to share any resources. We should all be teaching green chemistry if you're in chemistry. Um, and uh, yeah, the lab director. So I've had the challenge of moving a pretty intensive lab class online. Very cool. Um, Zach, go ahead. Sure. Um, I'm Zach. Uh, I'm a biochemist at the College of St. Scholastica, which is just up the road from Jane in Duluth. Um, and Jane is my, is my mentee. Um, the project I was gonna work with her and gonna do that at some point um, is working on um, integrating some active learning with green chemistry into, I teach an intro level sustainability class. And so I was looking to integrate some active learning um, in with some chemistry and sustainability. Um, yeah, so that's, that's me. And this is, again, I, I'm part of the new Palm cohort, mm -hmm. December cohort, I guess, whatever, whatever the, yeah. the most recent one was. Okay, Megan? Uh, I'm Megan Litster. I'm uh, not very far from you guys at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Um, I teach a variety of classes. Um, I teach an intro bio class for non majors, which is the active learning class that um, that I'll be working with Mallory, who is right below me. <laughs> um, and uh, I also teach anatomy, and physiology, and pre service science teachers. Um, and so my mentee now she's over here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Two more for Brady Bunch effect. Um, <laughs> Melanie, looks like you're in a beautiful uh, locale there with that background. Yeah. That's my, yeah, that's my new virtual background for office hours. I still have to work on mine. I haven't put one up there. <laughs> Yeah, this is, it's actually, um, I have a, a trail that I run on. This is uh, from, from the trail. Yeah, it is beautiful. And where are you at? Um, I'm at Raritan Valley Community College. We're in central New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So right, basically right in the center of New Jersey. Cool. Keep going around. Uh, Greg, how about you? Um, hi, so basic intro, is that what we're doing yep. here? Sorry, I was late. Uh, Greg Crowther, I teach anatomy and physiology, human anatomy and physiology at Everett Community College, north of Seattle. Um, so that's me. And uh, like last time, you win the prize for uh, being 7.34 in the morning and joining us. So uh, thank you for that. <laughs> yep, I've had my eggs and my hot chocolate, so I'm ready to go, kind of. Okay. I've got two left. I've got two left, and I can't cheat anymore because your full names aren't there. Let me do um, Havens. So I'm Mallory Havens. No, okay. um, yeah, it says I could have Havens. called you Dr. Havens, I suppose. But it's, hey, yeah, yeah, that works. Um, I'm at Lewis University, which is in the Chicago suburbs, and I am the mentee of Megan, who introduced herself already. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm looking to put active learning in my general biology courses. So I teach general biology for majors, one and two in the labs. I also teach the biochemistry series for biochem majors undergraduate researchers, senior thesis, a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking to get more active learning in there, particularly in the concepts where we tend to lose majors, particularly those who um, are not white. So trying to increase retention. Great. And then finally, we have Rachel. 
Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Rachel Horak. I'm at the American Society for Microbiology, and I'm on the Palm Steering Committee. So I'm not a mentor or a mentee, but I thought I'd drop in and um, see what kind of activities were going on um, in the Palm Network. And um, my job at, a at the ASM is working with a community of practice for undergraduate microbiology educators. So we have things like a listserv, we have a national conference for undergraduate biology education, um, and I do what I can to support biology and microbiology educators in this time of teaching disruption. Thank you. So um, you guys had all been given a paper that was done in a CBE several years ago about the best way to do videos for online instruction. And my motivation when I was uh, figuring out what to uh, have us do this month was basically, all right, we're all in this situation right now. I need to find an excuse to get us to all talk about it. And this paper is a very good excuse to do that. Um, this is a group that is dedicated to active learning practice. And we are all simultaneously now challenged with preserving um, active learning in a time where we are not face to face with our students. Now, um, this is not something that can't be done, right? There's lots of papers out there that describe how it can be done. Um, this is a good opportunity, I think. Uh, we did this in yesterday's conversation. It was very productive. Um, just to get a sense of what people have been doing, uh, be it videos, be it other tactics, to um, triage their classes or maybe even go a step further and preserve whatever active learning practices they had been doing before uh, the outbreak and before all of online instruction started. So I'd love um, if someone would like to get us started with their uh, their particular strategies and we can do some comparative shopping here, if you will. <laughs> Let I'd be call. happy to yeah, go. Go for it. Yeah. I was okay. Five seconds away from calling on somebody. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can go for it. So I'm in a um, tough situation because I'm at a primarily teaching institution and we're understaffed at the time. So I'm teaching about 17 credit hours. And um, <laughs> so I have seven, seven different preps that I'm trying to move online, including three different lab courses three lectures and then undergraduate researchers. So um, for, but I have had a crash course in this before because I had a baby 10 weeks premature. So very unexpected. So I had to emergency move online about 16 months ago for half of a semester. So I do have a little practice. Oh, did I lose you guys? Nope. No. Oh, okay. It disappeared on my screen for a second, but, um, <clears throat> So for lectures, I've also discovered a lot of my students are now caring for siblings or their own children, so they can't necessarily show up synchronously with me. So I've had to record um, through Blackboard Collaborate lectures for them, and then um, for stuff I would normally draw on the board, I've been doing recorded pen casts and um, trying to still give homework assignments with a place for them to turn in and then emailing or Zooming with them when they have questions. But it has been pretty difficult, um, especially because everyone's priorities have changed. The students are more stressed out, we're more stressed out, um, and just trying to coordinate with their new schedules. Um, so Recording lectures, pen casts, trying to do anything where they can actually see me write things out stepwise. I think uh, we decided um, to not reinvent the wheel um, and have been really just curating content. So using videos that are already out there as opposed to creating our own. Um, so for my Nat and Fizz class, um, there's some really great, like we're right in the middle of uh, well, we're just finishing up some neuroscience. So two minute neuroscience is some really good videos, which um, after when I was reading the paper, I was like, oh, they do all of these things that they're talking about in the paper, right? It's really short, sub, you know, short, they're drawing, you know, so um, as opposed to me doing it, which would be fine, um, but uh, we chose to go that way. And then my bio 100 class on non-majors, I 
love Amoeba Sisters, so <laughs> I'm a huge fan. Um, so we've been using them with Edpuzzle um, to sort of break up the lecture, where you insert questions while you're going, which are not for credit, but really just do you understand what's going on? Um, and as opposed to just me doing lectures, um, because hypothetically, uh, we're not moving online permanently. So I was like, I don't know that I necessarily want to, hypothetically, exactly. Um, I want to- scary uh, statement, hypothetically, we're not moving online permanently, but I hope it's more than hypothetical. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, there's talk of summer classes going online too. So, yeah. um, which we're, you know, we don't really want it. So we've really tried to take what's already out there and then add to it so that the that the they're not focusing on us they're focusing on the content and we've already used a bunch of videos in class so with the like amoeba sisters and stuff that they're familiar with so so one of the things i find that people are learning is number one who your colleagues are that were already embracing online learning <laughs> that's certainly been important for me it turns out a couple of my colleagues who i know pretty well Actually, this has been sort of a hobby of like learning all the new toys and all the new apps and things you can use. And so that's been immensely uh, important to me. And then also, as you described, like people being aware already of existing resources and being able to share those resources with other people to not, um, as you say, reinvent the wheel. Um, one of the big things that we've talked about and was a subject of our conversation yesterday was um, not so much the active learning components of things, but the lab component of things as well, that because of the precise week in which this happened, that many people had just finished, um, for example, I'm a molecular biologist by trade, so uh, just got mm -hmm. done with a lot of the um, construction and you know really complicated parts, and then we were ready for the exciting data collection part. Oh, now we're not gonna collect any data. And so what are people doing in lieu of that? And I've heard amazing ranges. Uh, the most extreme example um, we've had is people actually like putting together kits to send to people. I, I am not that person. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, going virtual with data or making up a data set or things like that. And so um, hearing all these different ranges has been very, it's a fascinating thing for me. And I see Rachel is posting resources in the uh, chat and I thank her for that as we're going here. That's excellent. You're welcome. There's literally hundreds there. So if yeah. you don't want to reinvent a wheel, we've taken <laughs> a bunch of uh, places where you can find intro bio lectures um, that are quite good. Um, so, and then add your own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm finding it just totally overwhelming, the number of resources. There's, I've had so many thrown at me. I don't have time. You know, I have 300 students that are taking the course now. I don't have time. Um, so for the, and I, I want to, so um, I have two courses that are extremely different in format. One is the organic laboratory class, and it's like two semesters in one, twice a week. And what I'm struggling with, well, what I've decided to do is we did the TAs made videos of the lectures so they can see what would have happened. So we've done approximately seven or eight experience, experiments where they're learning techniques. And I have technique videos I've been using for 15 years that are really helpful. Um, but then, uh, uh, so the TAs ran the experiments and collected masses and data, and then we have spectral data, NMR and IR from other years, and I'm posting those, but what I've um, struggled with a little bit is trying to, trying to have structure to the course, so like they would come in and upload their pre-lab, uh, turn in their pre-lab notebooks, because I think if you don't have them prepare their notebooks, they're not going to be as knowledgeable watching the videos, so still trying to do that, it, it feels somewhat like, why are they preparing their notebooks when they're not doing the experiment? But trying to make it as live as possible as if they were there. And then, um, you know, trying to make the decision, how far ahead should I post? But then you have students coming in with questions. So I'm trying to keep it structured that it would be much like if they were still in class doing that. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. We've gotten through our, our first, first week here. Um, 
and the, the TAs were so creative in making really engaging, entertaining videos. I'm, I'm hoping that goes well. But then having pre-lab quizzes, which we always had, and trying to schedule those out. So I have lab at um, five different times during the week. Uh, um, and uh, so that's how I'm trying to think of it. And then there's lab reports. So providing all the data for the laboratory reports. Uh, Maybe we can talk about it later, but I don't know if any of the universities are offering that students can now take courses mm -hmm. pass fail instead of the full course. And I, I'm not sure, confused about the questions from the students as does that change the curve? And I don't see why it would. I've never given a pass fail in a laboratory course like this because it's a four credit course. And I don't want to talk too long, but then for my lecture course, it was the, the green chemistry course. It was totally a flipped classroom, mostly where students read articles and then class time was, um, you know, discussions and working on assignments like look up your toxic release inventory in your area and share out or do poster presentations. So I'm trying to use Zoom to the best of my abilities. I'm just learning how to use breakout rooms. Anybody like a pro at breakout rooms? I learned if you do it randomly, it's chaos because they don't have each other's emails. And um, I think I need to set up a signing Zoom breakout rooms. I've had a couple conversations um, based on some other of these types of uh, meetings where people have used breakout rooms to varying degrees of success. Um, one of the other things we were going to do uh, before everything went to pot was have a uh, research symposium or some kind of a poster session. And a couple people have tur turned me on to the idea of taking advantage of the breakout rooms to simulate a poster session. I'm cautiously intrigued by that. I, I could see how that would devolve into a mess very quickly. And you can't assume, of course, that all of your students have internet where they are but darn it i'm really intrigued by that idea <laughs> of using uh, the breakout rooms as sort of separate uh, poster areas so i can see the uh, potential power of using those for these but as you say with uh, with caution i'm not really familiar with their practice yeah the stu a, a pretty big requirement of the course is all students are supposed to find a um you know a current event about green chemistry and do a green chemistry presentation. So on Monday, I was able to have two groups um, do presentations that everybody could see and give feedback on, and, and that went pretty well. So. Excellent. Have people been doing, oh, Melanie, please go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to yeah. mention that um, I don't know if you have used the Jove videos, it's G-O-V-E, yep. um, for our college uh, through our librarian now, they're uh, freely available right to all of our faculty. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that in terms of the lab, so I have, I have three different courses. I have a general biology um, two for honors. I have a general biology general section and I also teach genetics. So. Um, trying to balance three different labs online is, uh, has been very challenging. Um, in my general biology two honors course, we do a water quality project where students um, do nine different tests and determine the, the quality of the water. And then they do a big presentation at the end, like a capstone project. Um, likely we're gonna have to give them the data for them to complete that project. Um, for the general biology section, I'm trying to go to online labs, which again is, is somewhat challenging to try to find the right level, the right topic. And then for genetics also, um, you know, we're right in the middle of a cloning project. We're cloning the alpha amylase gene um, from one bacterial species into another. Um, and, you know, that that's just not, you know, I, I can't continue with that, that project. It's just not gonna happen. So mm -hmm. it's trying to find, um, supplemental or online labs that address some of those key concepts. 
Um, but the, it has been challenging and it is time consuming. And I agree with Jane, you know, I could spend an awful lot of time, um, you know, just trying to find one, one piece of information, you know, and I, I, I'm trying to use my time wisely. Um, there's six of us in, in the house under one roof and that's challenging. Um, so, um, yeah, so I guess we're all kind of in the same boat, but it, it, it's trying to identify pieces of information relatively quickly and being able to transform them into something online. Yeah. Um, so, so, um, uh, what, what compelled me to, to apply to the Palm thing was, was my sustainability class. Um, it's, it's not a subject that I have any formal training in, um, and it's an intro level class to our sustainability majors, but a, a big part of it was, was trying to, um, um, civic engagement or community engagement, and trying to apply the chemistry we've learned to, to the Duluth community. Um, and, and that's what my, like the remnants of this train wreck of a semester, <laughs> whatever is left, um, I'm, I'm trying to do group projects. I'm trying to have each group prepare a poster for actually a, a virtual poster session that apparently we're going to hold. Um, and, and it's, it's, I, I figured it was better than just yelling at them over zoom and doing quizzes and exams. Um, cause it was, it was more them trying to compile their knowledge and, and, and present it in a way that was meaningful. Um, I have no idea if it's going to work or not, but I guess we'll find out in about a month if, if the groups can come together. Um, I thought they could at least do it asynchronously. I thought that was a helpful thing that they don't, they don't all have to be exactly at the, you know, 9 a.m. Um, but, but how they're going to figure out their little bits and pieces and try to make a coherent story about um, the sustainability of road salt um, is going to be a, a, a it's going to be a trick, but, a, but it certainly is something that I figured it was better than, I don't know what, right. It was, it was, it was, it was better than, I don't know what else we were going to do. For the rest of the semester. Um, so what I was actually really pleased about with this with this paper you sent out is I've been posting short, what I thought was short, they were not short, um, short little videos about about these various subtopics about, you know, if you're analyzing road salt, what are, you know, what, what, what are the basic chemistry you need to know and um, what kinds of things would you want to explore? And I, th I thought I was being very clever by limiting my videos to 15 to 20 minutes. And I thought I was on the cutting edge of education here. Um, and then I read the paper and I was like, damn it, like not even close. <laughs> uh, so, so clearly I needed to read this paper before I started posting those videos. Um, um, I, I, so I, I found it really helpful because I've never tried to do this before. I mean, uh, we're, we're used to our nice long lectures and chatting with the students and that kind of back and forth interaction. Um, and, and so now I'm going to try, I'm trying to think about how can I make these puppies even shorter? I mean, you know, five, 10 minutes, um, which I, I can talk about a topic maybe in that time. Um, it's, it's, it's really, so this, this paper was really interesting about the best way to convey that type of information because I, I thought I was doing it well and apparently I, I need to do some more work on this. I uh, met my, uh, la my now former lab class, now we're a journal club class, uh, yesterday. We did it synchronously and I had a student who couldn't come uh, until much later because he was taking an um, exam for somebody else. And so he came in, I was just wrapping up and shutting things down and he popped in and he was surprised we weren't all, we weren't still all talking because it had been like, I think he was like an hour and 10 minutes or something in. He said, well, I thought you guys would still be talking about the paper. I'm like, have you met your fellow students? Like time span, seven to 10 minutes, you're distracted. And so one of the things I've definitely learned very quickly this week, trying to talk to people is that all that stuff is accentuated when they're just sitting staring at you on a computer screen. When you know they have, you know, some uh, whatever app on underneath you <laughs> on the side while you're talking, you know, we're not stupid. So all of these things come into play, right? And I, I, I definitely um, appreciate that thought, Zach, that you share about the need to sort of get bits of information out there in some senses. What are some other insights that people have done or what I, other, yeah. I'm sorry, I just had a, just a general question because I'm just curious. Um, I haven't heard from all of my students and I'm just curious, especially for the large lecture class like you mentioned, Jane, like I, I don't know the best way to check in on them. Like I, I, we have email, we have Canvas, we have announcements, we have a ton of ways to communicate, but um, I haven't heard from probably over 50% of my students. And I'm a little concerned <laughs> because, um, you know, we're asking them to do all these things and 
uh, you know, and to communicate with one another. But I've had a few emails where students were either stuck where they were on spring break or they had to travel to someone else's home. They don't have their materials. They don't have their laptop. They don't have, you know, so I, I'm just curious how others are checking in to make sure that their students are okay. Like I, that's my biggest concern right now. Our university asked us to report um, by the end of this week students who haven't re-engaged. Um, like you have to do at the beginning of the semester for students who don't show up for financial aid reasons. Yeah. And then I think our network of people who reach out to at-risk students are gonna try to re-engage them for us. I mean, I, I try to reach out via email, but if they're not on their technology, it just goes out into the ether. But um, so what I've been doing is at, at least having one assignment due in every class this week so I can actually see if somebody is turning stuff in. And I've had a good response rate to that, but just lectures. And I don't know if people are watching them. Right. Zach? My, my idea, and we'll find out this Friday if it's succeeding, um, but because I was also concerned with, the, with this asynchronous nature of what I'm trying to construct here, um, I was concerned about students just, you know, wandering off into the ether and never seeing them again. Um, so I made I made Google Docs with each different group and then each one of their names, and I told them by each Friday they they all have to type something by their name about what they're working on. Um, that that and it, and it can be just as simple as like I'm I'm poking away researching something about compost. Cool. Like I, as long as they've written words, something that they're doing, something that I I know that they're that they're engaging in the class. Um, and I don't know if that's going to work, but. I figured it's 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 at least a weekly check-in, which is better than trying to email them and never say. I, I don't I don't know. It, 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 there's 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 a lot of question marks, and part of me is really interested in learning this new stuff, but part of me is sort of terrified if it doesn't work. And I've just lost my class. So so it's it, it's certainly it's it's intellectually stimulating if it wasn't actually real, right? Like if <laughs> uh, if it was an experiment, I'd be stoked about it. But but these are students' education on the line, and 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 for me, that's that it's 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 really high stakes. It seems like that should work, right? I mean, it would either be people aren't engaging or the uh, or they simply forgot to do the assignment, but if it was the latter, you could pick that out pretty quickly. So yeah, I'd be interested to, interested to hear how that works, but it seems on paper like that's a good idea. So. How are people doing, uh, sort of Zach got me thinking about this, um, Synchronous learning versus asynchronous learning. Um, with larger classes, I imagine it would be harder to try to maintain um, a synchronous environment, and maybe people simply aren't available at the times they would have been had we still been in session. So um, I'm curious if people are still trying to meet uh, their classes at certain days and times, or if people switched over to asynchronous methodology. Yeah, Jane, go ahead. I, I am trying to um, have have the students kind of attend 10 for like the first two hours, or the TAs are available the first two hours. They have to upload their pre-lab notebooks like they would and take a prep quiz at the times they would have lab um, during the week. So Monday, Wednesday, 1220. Um, and I've, I am making it more flexible. At first, it was like, okay, you have to upload within the first hour. But now I've kind of expanded it to four hours <laughs> for people that are saying, now I'm in charge of my siblings. I'm on the East Coast. I'm on the West Coast, whatever. So, But I still want to keep those blocks, I think, um, because they're trying to arrange all their other courses and, and other courses. My colleagues are trying to keep it in those course times, I think. The lecture, I usually give three lectures on the same topic every Tuesday to prep them for lab. And so I'm just doing that once where everybody could attend then if they can, but then recording it so then it's available always for whenever someone could do it. Um, back to, oh wait, I forgot your name, Haven. What's your first name? Oh, it's Alaska. Mallory. Mallory, sorry. sorry. Yeah. yeah. I know it must be an issue that some of my colleagues aren't having large engagement because an email went out, you know, how many students are have checked in and are keeping up. And um, I 
remarkably with my lab class, you know, 95%, I had a quiz on Tuesday and um, almost everyone took it and everybody that didn't did check in to get an extension for whatever the gazillion, uh, all the different circumstances in my senior level lab class, but I know it must there must be other people that are, are um, struggling with the engagement. Certainly people are in quarantine. Students went back to their home countries in quarantine. So it's really challenging. I think that's what's hard about keeping up is trying to keep up with all these different circumstances and being flexible and making sure everybody's well in, in all ways, mentally and physically. Yeah. Uh, we decided, um, well, our administration encouraged us to go asynchronous as much as possible. Um, we did not choose to go pass fail, um, which I am a little disappointed in. Um, but the system, basically the way our system works is if you get a fail, it impacts your GPA. If you get a pass, it does not impact your GPA. Um, so um, the inequities in that were um, highly considered. Um, I know a lot of universities are actually giving people options to change to no, pa no grade versus pass. Mm -hmm. um, and our administration has said they're not going to do that just because of the nature of our class. I don't, whatever, but we, we have been, in, we have been encouraged to go asynchronous just for equity issues. Um, and um, so we're trying, um, there are some faculty that are just saying, no, we're going to go synchronously. And I think they might, sort of have a little bit of a disaster on their hands, but um, I, 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 yeah, I'm going, yeah, asynchronous. I have weekly assignments. That's how I'm hoping to check in, like Mallory's asking and Melanie's asking, like, how do you check in with your students? Um, like Jane said, I think my first class, I, and I'm gonna hold like online hours every day that we would have class. That first class, I'm gonna say, it's highly encouraged that you come in and just check in with us and say, Hey to everybody. I think that was one thing my students were really concerned about was we're not going to see you again for the rest of the semester. And I'm like, well, you'll see me. <laughs> um, I, I will still be there, but um, they were really, really concerned about not being able to interact with me. So I think that's something that um, I'm going to hold space for them. You know, I've heard horror stories about students not showing up and you're the only one there. Um, but I'll hold space for them because that's what they said they wanted. So we might reassess after the first week because we, we start Monday. So, yeah. So, um, Greg, I'm reading, oh, your, I'm, sorry. Um, I'm reading your idea here on the chat. And um, do you want to uh, introduce this to the group? It seems intriguing. Oh, you're muted. There you go. All right. Am I unmuted now? Now I can't see anybody, but. Um, yeah, so I just, um, we're on spring break, I'm, I'm thinking about what I might do. And I had this idea of let's assume that we just have these online lectures, our own or others, to have the students watch asynchronously. What can we then do with that synchronous time? I was thinking maybe, maybe, so my students signed up for the class you know, assuming that they would be able to come to campus at these designated times. So I'm hoping that most of them can still be present for those lecture times. But I'm wondering, would it make sense to divide the 110 minute lecture up into, I don't know, 11, 10 minute blocks, and then each small group of students gets a chunk of that, like, okay, you four, you show up from 11 to 11 10 a.m. and you four come from 11 10 to 11 20 just to get the group size down so i can interact with them um, to me that seems like it might be easier to manage than breakout rooms right where you have to trust the students or be better at helping the students help each other you know which is very powerful but i, I don't feel like that's a strength of mine as a teacher is knowing how to make sure the students are interacting really well with each other. So I guess I'm interested in getting more kind of small group time for me with each, with each small set of students. So, but I'm happy to take any comments that anyone has about this idea. 
I had mulled over something similar to that with my lab class in sort of keeping some activities going. The logistics, I think, would be your problem, right? That it sounds good on paper that these people would be there at 11 o'clock and 11.10, 11.20, but then like when real life actually fits into that, I think that'd be a really difficult thing to pull off, you know? It's not that it's not a good, it's not that it wouldn't be a good idea, it's that like it'd be just hard to get everyone to on board with it, I would think. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. learned that. Yeah, so what are you going to do if someone can't attend in that time block is the, is the real challenge. So you record the conversation that students have and then let them read it, or how do you get their, their input and participation is what seems really challenging yeah. that I'm learning. Yeah. I, I, I was just going to mention um, just, just how I, I decided to structure um, the course going, our, our courses going forward is to create like a one week module starts Monday morning. It ends Sunday at 1159. Everything is asynchronous and students can complete the assignments, you know, during the week, whenever they have availability. And I tried to pare down the complexity of the course. So I'm just focusing on one particular topic per week. And then instead of doing like a big exam or something like that, they're, they're going to be just assessed through short, you know, case studies, activities, or quizzes. Um, but everything in my course is completely asynchronous. They can come in and work whenever they have availability. Um, through our LMS, you know, we can do discussions, we can do peer review. Um, things like that. So we, they can engage with other students. It's just not at a particular, they don't have to meet at a particular time. Um, I do hold office hours through Zoom. Um, and the, again, those are optional office hours and students can just check in and um, ask questions. I was really surprised the very first um, virtual office hours I ever did, students were in the waiting room the entire time. <laughs> I thought that, you know, I thought maybe I'm going to get no one. It's going to be crickets. Um, I've had more was, people in really office hours surprised. than ever before. Uh -huh. Exactly. Most ever. <laughs> exactly. So it was really, it was really wonderful. I think they really did want to communicate face to face or to hear a voice. And so um, anyway, that's, that's how I decided to structure the rest of my classes. And it gives me structure. I'm really bad unless I have structure. I need to, to be very focused or else I get distracted easily. So for me and for my students, that's the way I've decided to do it. I, I think I'm the only one and maybe not. I, I have 18 TAs and what I felt like I couldn't do. I, and they're still being paid. So there's some obligation that they need to have structure plus half of them are well, all of them are still doing research, and so I needed to have some structure because um, I couldn't have it just be a free-for-all that they were available all the time for students, and they need to know how to balance their time. So that's why I'm putting some structure in each week with each experiment to come to those hours. Um, anyway. Uh, I'm a little worried about um, asking too much with all the online assignments. Yeah. I'm trying to make it, you know, my course is active learning and the fact that for the laboratory course, it's discovery based. It's supposed to be guided inquiry where each, each experiment has a question they're supposed to solve. And so now it's even harder to make this like this is how a real scientist would explore what's the stereoselectivity of that reaction. And so you don't want to like throw out all the, the answers that they would come to at once, you know, so that they're thinking scientifically. Um, and then for the, the lecture class that was flipped again, having them read articles, so trying to assess, but then I feel like I'm always posting assessments and I'm struggling with the balance of am I trying to do too much? Yeah, like you don't in order to, to make it a good learning outcome experience here. You don't want to send in the busy work in the process of trying to keep them right. 
what you feel is keeping them occupied. And I think of what we're all learning collectively is what concepts are truly the central important concepts we want to get in our classes, because clearly um, in a abrupt transition like this, something has to go or something has to change. Um, if you had designed it online from the beginning, um, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. But in this situation, um, to be cliched about it, less is probably more. And keeping those fundamental uh, things going and not worrying if you're not, you know, throwing a problem set at them every time, you're, you're probably in better shape than you think you are because as several of you have alluded to, that they're in a weird situation too. And I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a student on Zoom yesterday about putting his, um, he's a junior and so he's getting ready to do a, an honors capstone next year and the proposals are due next week. And I, I got the sense he just enjoyed seeing a human being that wasn't in his family, quite honestly. Uh, <laughs> and so all these things are weighing on people as we're giving them ideas. So I think if it's, not a, if it doesn't feel as rigorous to you on your end, I don't think it's as bad as you think it is, is what I'm trying to say in a convoluted way. <laughs> okay. Um, other, any other thoughts on just how people are doing? I think we've had a good diverse set of ideas here. I appreciate the resources people have shared. And if not, and if nothing else, it's good to know that everyone is sort of in the same boats you know you're afraid you're doing it the worst but everyone's in the same situation no really i'm the worst honestly <laughs> okay um i believe can i can i i know the best i know for videos 10 minutes or less is better but i can't i don't have time to make five 10 minute videos and then do all the other stuff. Can, right. Is everybody compromising a little bit? Because yes. they can I, go I, back. Because they can go back and stop it anytime they want. Exactly. Someone make me feel better about that. <laughs> you can actually say at the beginning of your video as you're making it, feel free to break this up into small pieces, right? Like give your students the freedom to do that. Yeah, we're all making compromises, don't worry. <laughs> But I know, I know from my personality as well, sometimes I need someone to say that to me. So I get it, I get it. All right. Um, those of you who are in the new cohort, is, the, um, is there another journal club coming up? Tomorrow. That is tomorrow, what time is that at? Um, okay, so I'm on central time and it is at noon central, noon central time. Okay. Yeah, and then there's like some meeting after the journal club for mentors, I think. Yeah, orientations. Okay, and Sue's going to take you. I may or may not be at this, but Sue will definitely be there to take you through this stuff. All right. Um, yes. Yeah. I thought if someone said something. Okay. I'm. Oh well, I can say it really fast. My internet just went out and then came back on, so that's a plug for asynchronous learning because <laughs> it happens even to us. <laughs> That's a good real-time example. Uh, this will be posted on the ASCB website soon, and you'll hear about it when it gets up there. Um, otherwise, uh, everyone stay safe, do your best, and uh, we'll be in touch in a couple of weeks. The um, texts, like the chat on the side, is that will that be available with the recording? That was an excellent question. I do not know. I believe so but I'm not confident of that. Or Rachel, at least maybe the resources could yeah. be made. Rachel, are you on the uh, POM, uh, like the, the, well, clearly works you're here, those emails I send out. Would you mind sending the resources at least to me or maybe just to the group? Yes. Thank you, that'd be, that'd be awesome. It does populate somewhere, I've noticed from my Zoom meetings okay. that I've recorded, but you have to kind of search to find it. Okay. All right. Thank you. I was just going to say on your list of resources is the remote teaching uh, resource group, and that's my Facebook group that I moderate with uh, 12 other people, so I was actually pretty excited. We're, we're a very select group. We, we don't let everybody in, like a lot of those, a lot of them. Um, the reason, because we don't want any people selling or whatever, so. Yeah. Um, 
we, uh, a lot of the others are at like 20,000 members. We have 30, well, almost 4,000 now, but um, mm -hmm. I just, I was very excited. I was like, woohoo, my group. It's is helpful. <laughs> so You even let a chemist in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you're really a teacher, we let you in, but we've had a lot of people come in and try and spam and sell products. Mm. Um, we kick them out. So um, a lot of the others are open groups and we're not an open group, so. Yeah. Megan, what's the name of your group? Um, it's the Remote Teaching Resource Group. Okay. Uh, I'll have to uh, be your BFF if you let me in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, my Thank one you. suggestion is it's, there's a three questions that says you have to agree to the rules. Most people don't agree to the rules, and we don't let it, you in unless you agree to the rules. So agree to the rules. So, okay. I, my I, one suggestion. I'm a rule follower, so I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I just... I was excited it was on the list. So. All right. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Have a good one.